Hi, in this video, let's discuss the next set of questions starting with B12 deficiency in elderly. So what could be the most probable cause? So if you refer literature, mostly it's absorption related issues. So vitamin B12 deficiency is most often caused by digestive system difficulties which occur if the body is unable to absorb B12 from foods and liquids. So there can be uh, many diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, pernicious anemia, etc. which can lead to decreased uh, B12 levels in your body. Most importantly, elders are at a higher risk of developing a deficiency mainly due to decreased absorption along with dietary changes or decreased food intake and also in uh, people who are on vegetarian diet there can be b12 deficiency or they're susceptible to b12 deficiency because b12 is strictly found in animal products right moving on to the next topic implant angulation I've got several keywords pertaining to this mini implant angulation implant angulation or orthodontic implant or angulation we'll just go through some literature and see which of the following correlates with the question if you need any additional points do let me know in the comment section I'll up update it in the description part of the video right so the angulation of implant why is it important it's one of the important factors in the management of stress in peri implant structures the behavior of bone in peri implant region is closely related to direction magnitude and concentration of stresses transmitted to the implant angulations of implant can reduce cantilever forces when applied load is in same direction of implant angulation in one of the references pertaining to orthodontic implants it's mentioned that orthodontic implants have become a reliable method in orthodontic practice for providing temporary additional anchorage the implants may be placed under an angulation between 10 to 20 degrees and up to 45 degrees in maxilla particularly a 30 to 40 degree angulation to the long axis of its in teeth and a 10 to 20 degree angulation in mandible are recommended to avoid dental injuries besides this angle increases the area of bone contact and ensures greater primary stability and in one of the article references it's clearly mentioned that a previous study by Petri et al. 2010 conducted using a polyurethane bone and applying lateral traction loads has demonstrated the most effective mini implant insertion angle to the bone surface for mechanical retention is 90 degrees. This is uh, in relation to the bone surface, right? So let me know if at all any additional points are mentioned or any additional keywords are mentioned in the question we'll go through this once again if necessary right now moving on to the next topic reproximation we have discussed the same in our study club also it's a synonym for proximal slicing so if you refer literature proximal stripping is a method by which proximal surfaces of teeth are sliced in order to reduce the mesodistal width of teeth space regaining it's for space regaining isn't it it's also known as uh, reproximation slenderization disking and proximal slicing all this procedure is routinely carried out on lower anteriors it can be done even in upper anteriors and buccal segments of upper and lower arches so one of the methods of gaining space reproximation proximal stripping or slenderization or even disking we have different names for it now moving on to the next topic uh, secondary alveolar grafting uh, when do we go for this age group so in one of the articles it's clearly mentioned that secondary alveolar bone grafting is ideally done between 9 to 11 years before the eruption of maxillary canine this is very very important in order to allow the canine to erupt to grafted site so to go through some additional literature pertaining to this Reconstruction of alveolar cleft with bony tissue started early in 1900s and uh, till 1960s primary alveolar grafting was the treatment of choice. The term primary means operation which is done during the first two years of life. Secondary alveolar bone grafting is done before the eruption of canine. Primary alveolar grafting has become increasingly unpopular because of adverse effects on growth though there are advocates of procedure who have reported normal growth. Secondary alveolar grafting has become a well-established procedure since the original work of Boyne and Sands in 1972. Bergland et al. published a large series of patients who had undergone alveolar cleft grafts with considerable success. Secondary alveolar grafting is ideally done between 9 and 11 years before the eruption of maxillary canine to allow the canine to erupt or towards or to the grafted site. The alveolar bone graft is an essential step in the overall management of a patient with cleft lip and palate, right? So that's pertaining to literature of secondary alveolar grafting. 
now moving on to the next topic stationary anchorage so we have discussed the same um, in our study club discussions previously it's defined as a dental anchorage in which the manner and application of force tends to displace the anchorage unit bodily right in the plane of space in which the force is being applied the anchorage provided by a tooth resisting bodily movement is considerably greater than one which is resisting tipping force so uh, this is some literature pertaining to stationary anchorage right now moving on to the next topic greenspan syndrome greenspan lesion so we'll just go through some literature as you know greenspan syndrome it's a combination of uh, three lesions or three conditions rather lichen planus so interesting association of lichen planus diabetes mellitus and vascular hypertension has been described by greenspan the triad being described as green greenspan's syndrome this is greenspan syndrome by grupper so the term greenspan syndrome was coined by grupper however the report the reported associations between olp and systemic diseases may be coincidental because olp is relatively common it occurs predominantly in older adults and many drugs used in treatment of systemic diseases trigger the development of oral lichenoid lesions as an adverse effect so that's some uh, literature pertaining to greenspan syndrome greenspan lesion so this is what i found in few articles see in fact Oral hairy leukoplakey also called as Greenspan lesion because it was first described by a scientist named Greenspan. So Greenspan lesion is a better term than oral hairy leukoplakey. To go through some related literature, oral hairy leukoplakey is a white hyperplastic vertically corrugated lesion that occurs on the lateral border of tongue caused by Epstein-Barr virus as you know. So this oral uh, lichen planus might be the first sign of HIV infection in some patients and OHL was first seen in a group of isolated patients by Greenspan in 1984 and was described as asymptomatic white non-scrapable vertically corrugated hyperkeratotic hair like projections that appear on the lateral border of tongue and in one of the articles it's clearly mentioned that Greenspan lesion is a better term than oral hairy leukoplakia so based on the question i'm sure you can correlate with these discussions right now moving on to the next topic dental auxiliary so by definition dental auxiliary is a term for all persons who assist dentist in delivering dental care they can be classified into operating or non-operating depending upon whether they are allowed to carry out any intraoral procedures in the treatment of patients. The primary purpose of dentists delegating functions to allied dental professionals or personnel is to increase the capacity of profession to provide patient care while retaining full responsibility for quality of care. So dental auxiliary is a term for persons who assist dentists in delivering dental care. Right? Now, moving on to the next topic, nitrous oxide, its uh, characteristics or uh, its features. So, which are the following statements about NO is true? So, I think that was the kind of question you faced. So, good analgesic, weak anesthetic, causes complete amnesia. We'll just go through some literature. So, nitrous oxide is colorless, odorless, heavier than air, non-inflammable gases supplied under pressure in steel cylinders. It is non-irritating but low potency anesthetic. It's a low potency anesthetic. Unconsciousness cannot be produced in all individuals without concomitant hypoxia. Nitrous oxide is a good analgesic but poor muscle relaxant. So it's a good analgesic, poor muscle relaxant and has low potent anesthetic action. And nitrous oxide is generally used as a carrier and adjuvant to other anesthetics. A mixture of 70% nitrous oxide, 25 to 30% oxygen and 0.2 to 2% another potent anesthetic is employed for most surgical procedures. As a sole agent, nitrous oxide 50% has been used with oxygen for obstetric analgesia. In dental practice, nitrous oxide is now used to provide conscious sedation for allaying anxiety and apprehension. So that's um, some literature pertaining to nitrous oxide. Now coming to the penultimate topic, tumor lysis syndrome, as the name itself indicates, tumor cells on lysis release certain chemicals leading to some manifestations which we will go through now. Tumor lysis syndrome. 
is not associated with that was the question so i'll just directly go to the point tumor lysis syndrome occurs when tumor cells release their contents in bloodstream either spontaneously or in response to therapy leading to characteristic findings of hyperuricemia hyperkalemia hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia right so this tumor lysis syndrome is most common disease related emergence encountered by physicians treating various cancers all it develops most often in patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or acute leukemia. Its frequency is increasing among patients who have tumors that used to be only rarely associated with this complication. So the findings include characteristic findings, hyperuricemia, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia. Right? So these electrolytic and metabolic disturbances can progress to clinical toxic effects including renal insufficiency, cardiac arrhythmias, seizures and death due to multi-organ failure. Now moving on to the final topic, rickets. So what could be the manifestation in uh, rickets or what happens exactly in rickets. But before that, if we understand the function of vitamin D, calcitriol, then we'll understand what happens in its deficiency, isn't it? We'll discuss the same in detail in our e-classes as well as in study club discussions as well. So biochemical functions of calcitriol, so 125 DHCC, it's a active form of vitamin D, isn't it? Biological active form. So this calcitriol regulates plasma levels of calcium and phosphate. It's action on intestine. Calcitriol increases the intestinal absorption of calcium. These are very, very important because once you know the normal functions, then you'll know what happens during deficiencies, right? So action, on cal action of calcitriol on intestine, it increases intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphate. Action of calcitriol on bone. This is very interesting. In osteoblasts of bone, calcitriol stimulates calcium uptake for deposition as calcium phosphate. Thus, calcitriol is essential for bone formation. The bone is an important reservoir of calcium and phosphorus or phosphate as such. Calcitriol along with parathyroid hormone increases the mobilization of calcium and phosphate from bone which causes elevation of plasma calcium and phosphate levels. So it's the action of calcitriol on bone. Action of calcitriol on kidney. Calcitriol is also involved in minimizing the excretion of calcium and phosphate through kidney by decreasing their excretion and enhancing reabsorption. So these are some of the functions of calcitriol, biochemical functions of calcitriol which is the biological active form of vitamin D. So once you know this, you know what happens in case of its deficiency. It can be rickets or any other related disorder. Right. So these are some of the topics which I wanted to highlight in this specific video. I hope it's clear.